I'm talking with Justin Davies today, who is the uh, founder of Imagination.com.au and uh, also at um, Present, that's P-R-E-Z-E-N-T-T dot com, which is a a presentation type software interface that uh, presenters and that sort of thing can use um, when developing uh, content that you go out and present and that sort of thing. And it's, it's actually fascinating because it bridges the gap between what we're teaching people, what we're showing people, and then actually how to interact with your audience and how to sort of take that to the the next step or, or allow those tools to be engaging um, after our presentation or even during our presentation. So it's it's a fascinating tool. So we talked to him about that as well as what um, uh, what's up and what's new with digital strategy and, and uh, if guru is actually still a word in online marketing. So uh, it's coming up really quick. Uh, Justin Davies on uh, Breaking Digital. Overwhelmed with online or just wanting to learn more about how you can build a successful business amidst all of the self-appointed to gurus, big buzzwords and empty promises. The Breaking Digital Podcast by Doyle Bueller tells you exactly what smart entrepreneurs need to know to escape the clutter, get clear of the confusion and pass the bullshit of building and growing a successful business online. It's about digital leadership and delivering the best value for your business online to your audience. Now, here's your host and author of the book on digital leadership and online marketing, The Digital Delusion, Doyle Bueller. Today I'm with Justin Davies, and he is from Imagination.com.au, all the way from Perth, Australia. And uh, Justin is a technology consultant for companies bridging technology as well as marketing. And he's got some extra projects as well that he's working on. So I'm really excited to be speaking with you today, Justin. So welcome. Thanks, Doyle. Uh, so nice to talk to you again. Uh, great to catch up with you in Perth recently. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So so tell us a bit about yourself, Justin. How, how, is the, how are things at Imagination.com.au? Yeah, going really well. Um, a little bit sort of, you know, just to kind of give you a flavor of what we're doing. Um, we're really focusing on growing companies that are or helping grow companies that are currently turning over between typically one to $20 million. And what we're trying to do is help them align their strategy and their marketing and their digital activity. So all of those three things are, are really three legs off the same stool. And if you've got one of those missing, then you're just not going to uh, – the, the thing's going to fall over. So we work in uh, – we, we coach, uh, we mentor, and we actually consult and deliver. So it's a mix depending on what the client wants, and it seems to be, uh, it seems to be really resonating with the market. Oh, excellent. And and you said alignment, like which is a, a keyword that I try to use every once in a while to make myself <laughs> sound good. But how, how do you how do you use it? <laughs> well, well, I think um I uh, I th- I think I mean one of the things I really like about uh, about your approach, Doyle, is that you're a bit anti-guru, right? So uh, I I like to be really pragmatic. Um, we like to just work out what where are we now and have a, a bit of an assessment of that. Where is it that we're actually seeking to go, and then we work out how we're going to get there. And what we generally find is that if you keep strategy, you know, nice and simple, nobody does long plans every, anymore. They all love. You know, they're all into a one-page plan, uh, which is we find works really, really well. So when you've got those things aligned, then uh, it just tends to work so much better. Uh, typically, we're talking to companies about a range of different things. You know, marketing, sales, you know, people, uh, implementation of projects, strategy, profit efficiency, leadership, you know, innovation, tech, systems, process, all this kind of stuff. And if you line all those things up and get them all uh, organized well, you're going to get a lean, efficient, and effective uh, business that's going to grow. And and so also, yeah, no, I yeah, that makes perfect sense too. And and I wasn't <laughs> sort of knocking you for that, but I, yeah, I think we we you know sometimes we get a little bit overwhelmed too. And and yeah, I, I agree. There's there's too many of these self-professed gurus and that sort of thing. So it's good to see that we've got yeah. some smart, pragmatic people like yourself out there um, that are making a difference. And because I think, if I may, it's because you're dealing with fundamentals. Right, like you, you're you're talking a lot about strategy, and do you, do you find that that like what what's your sense of the marketplace? Do do many businesses have strategies, or are they just kind of winging it? 
<laughs> yes, I think a lot of them are. I, I, I think, I think yeah, a lot, a lot of them, of them are wing winging it. it, or they have a strategy. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of them do wing it. I think a lot of them also are doing what they've always done, and so what then happens is that um, you look at you look at markets, and and the markets change, and the markets move. You know, for example, you take take a look at the taxi industry. You know, in, in Western Australia, there's there's a lot of angst about that at the moment in terms of what your yeah, Uber's doing to the market, yeah, as same across the uh, across the board, and it's been a protected industry. So the market's moved on that industry. And it's part in part it's been digital that's led it, but in part it's been a, a strategic um, approach to disrupt that market. So you've got this whole "who moved my cheese" problem that uh, and. Then it's a scramble to go to be sort of looking in the rearview mirror and go, look, I'd like it to just go back to the way it was when it was nice and we had a nice protected market and you know we could <laughs> go good, back the to good old twelve days. hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like that's that's just not pragmatic. So um, you know, doing a hundred and twenty page strategic plan with you know tons of appendices isn't the answer here you've got to look at really what are some pragmatic ways forward to mm -hmm. to do something about an industry and what do you typically um suggest as as a strategy like do you sort of provide like a specific guidelines or or just obviously it, it's um important to look at the market and the industry and the company and all that sort of thing but do you do you have sort of any guiding principles besides having a strategy because i've found i don't know if you've found but most companies do not have an overall strategy of what they want to accomplish. Yeah, I think, um, or they've got some vague notions of it, which is, yeah, you know, sometimes the vague notions are, I just want to do, you know, 10 or 20% better than I did last year. Um, so, um, I think, you know, I like, um, you know, we, we're talking about pragmatic stuff. I like Stephen Covey, you know, you start with the end in mind and looking for, you know, a win, uh, win situation wherever you can because then you've got you know, customers that are that are happy um, you've got a business that's you're potentially doing well and you've got to focus on what's you know really um, really valuable I think that approach really works and do you find that you know companies that don't have a strategy or you know will be able to do as well as those that do uh, only by dumbass luck, <laughs> really. It's <laughs> it's one of those things where that works if and they're in the right place at the right time and they're lucky. But um, I've always been of the view that a um, really smart team with an average product will beat a uh, average team with a fantastic product. Yeah. And I think that's held out uh, true you know, more times than not. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So you're you're definitely on the smarter side, then, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd like to think so. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, so, so tell me about some of the projects that you're working through. Yeah. So, um, one of the projects that we're um, working on at the moment is uh, is a product called uh, Present uh, P R E Z E N T T, -T. and uh, it was a it's a a business that a colleague of mine uh, and myself uh, started up a few years ago, and the idea that the issue that we were seeing was that uh, around this area of presentations, lots of people do presentations in front of an audience, and, and let me ask if you've been guilty of this, but you know, you do a, a presentation to an audience, um, you know, there could be a hundred people in the room, you get to talk to a few people after the presentation and grab a couple of business cards. Uh, then you get a few email requests to sort of email the presentation across to them, but it's 40 megs. So you're then trying to work out how do I break that down into bits so I can email it and you end up with all this admin stuff and a pile of business cards that sit on your desk nagging you to do something about it, which you often don't get to because there's so much uh, other stuff that's going back on in the market. So we thought that there was a problem big enough there that we wanted to uh, start exploring a market opportunity around that. And we um, after we'd done a bunch of research, concluded that there was, and then started uh, started building that project. So that's been uh, up and running live. We've got customers and users all around the world, uh, and uh, it's been going well. Yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating product, and and I, I yeah I, I feel your pain like doing presentations. They 
they're great. They're fantastic, but there's not really sort of that integration, you know, considering mm. it is the, the 21st century and all, um, yeah. we're still having, and yes, I still have a paper business card, but the point is, is that there's nothing really integrating those different channels, those different mediums. And, and if you do, then they're, they're so disjointed and, and yeah, it's like so often you, you do a presentation and there's, you can't kind of pull the pieces together or they take more work than the actual presentation. So that, that that's, that's fascinating. So how, how does it work? So basically what, uh, what happens is, uh, you, uh, create your presentation as you would, um, normally, you know, PowerPoint, Keynote, Prezi, uh, Canva, if you're, uh, if you're using that, whatever, you know, in design, whatever tool you like creating a presentation with, you then save the presentation as a PDF. Uh, upload that into present, save a little bit of detail about when your presentation is and where. And then when your audience arrives to your presentation, you give them a, a little uh, URL, shortened URL, and then they can access the presentation immediately. So they can actually take notes against each one of your slides as you're um, talking. They can connect to connect with you on social media. They can share a slide to the audience, you know, all those times when people take a photo and then try and share it on Twitter and then try and find your Twitter name and all those kinds of things. So we make all of that stuff really easy. Would, would that uh, be and, so that the Twitter uh, handles would be right on the presentation then? Yeah, so you can oh. you can basically share the, um, you know, like basically the way people use it, they take a photo of a, of a slide and sometimes they can't you know, get a great shot of it because they're a distance away or what have you. So it effectively takes the actual slide itself and uses that as the pick and shares that. Mm. And, yeah, with a link back to the main presentation yeah. as well. So it just makes that stuff seamless. Then on top of that, um, the users can you know, ask the presenter a question. You know, how many times have you been in a situation where really great presenters jumped up on stage, done their presentation, and then they've had to catch a flight somewhere else immediately as the presentation's done, you know, and you've wanted to ask some really relevant questions, but you've just not been able to connect with them. Um, we find the presenters actually want to connect with their audience as well to either build their you know, following and profile and, and so on, but being able to get that kind of interaction. So we've got all of that sort of in play. Um, and that's really what we've been working on in the last um, uh, last little while on uh, on that project. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about, you know, how we've pivoted on it just recently. Yeah, no, fascinating. There was, um, um, actually, uh, we need to get this tool out there, <laughs> Justin, because um, I was at this... Um, a pitch festival in Montreal and yeah. it's great because you've got all these, these, I wasn't presenting, I was one of the mentors. Um, but you have these but, great companies that are presenting and there's no way to sort of talk about them. You yeah. know, they had one hashtag, but you know, who, you know, uh, what, what specific, uh, uh, Twitter username are you and how do we like connect with you on social and how do we share the pictures that we take or or you know even the presentation and I was just dumbfounded that we're still stuck in this day and age and we can't actually share people's content even if it is brilliant because there aren't mm. any tools so you, you land out looking for you know you're searching on Twitter for their Twitter handle and then you miss the presentation and it's like oh god there's got to be a better way yeah that's all of that that's fantastic and oh, we should have got you to write down the, um, you know, when we we're doing the customer profiles, we could have got you to do them for us because they, you've <laughs> described a lot of the pain, uh, yeah. pain really well. Well, what's been interesting actually when we started the project is we, you know, we, I developed in conjunction with my co-founder Jeff Robson a whole bunch of um, potential customer profiles. And we looked at, you know, keynote presenters, we looked at marketing people, business development people, you know, small business owners that were doing training and consulting and, you know, some pitching and IP sharing and so on. Uh, and then we also did a, a profile on training companies. And what we found when we were going through uh, our lean development process is that we were really working on this, the you know, quite standard minimum viable product uh, model to put something in the hands of users and get that in, out into the market. Uh, and I really am a big fan of that because, you know, having been involved as a mentor in a lot of startup weekends, a lot of those early stage um, pitch fests and development um, uh, type weekends, 
it's so interesting to see when people miss the mark in terms of what they think is a great idea and what the customers, potential customers actually think is a great idea uh, in, in terms of what they want. So uh, it's been interesting actually because in terms of working all through that, we've actually found that of all of those segments that uh, have interest and get value and you know, bearing in mind we've got customers in all of them, um, the ones that seem to have the most affinity towards the product and interestingly where the best business case is are training organisations. Mm. You know, those organisations that have traditionally and many of them still do uh, print, you know, workbooks and print out the, you know, the uh, PowerPoint slide decks and actually hand those out to the people attending the presentations. Yeah, and that, that's a huge step in terms of uh, the, the training industry itself because, mm -hmm. yeah, having conducted workshops myself, like it, it's, again, there's there's nothing to kind of connect it um, mm. to what you're doing and what you're saying and, and how do you get all those pieces together. So so you, this is a, a recent pivot that you said? Yeah, it's it's been something that we've just done in the last two months. And Excellent. so um, and what we're finding there is that um, – it's funny, you know. Sometimes when you when you're working on a, a startup, you yeah, you know, for a while it feels like hard work, and then um, you get to the point where you go, "Hello, we think we've got product market fit here," because all of a sudden we've got people saying to us, "Oh, well, the business case makes so much sense," and I've got people I can introduce you to, and on, you know these guys should be using it, and so on. Yeah, broadly, the, the business case becomes really, really easy. Um, most training companies allow something like $50 to $100 US per person per course for the production, delivery, dissemination of the training content. Now, if we can do it for a tenth of that, that then means that their payback on our product is around eight weeks. It starts to become a really quite compelling, uh, quite compelling proposition very, very quickly. Yeah, and that would be like what level of training organization would that be? Well, uh, basically, it, it almost doesn't matter um, really because if the if you've got somebody that's delivering, um, uh, you know, courses, you know, one a month to to thirty people, it doesn't really matter because we price on a. With this is an interesting thing too uh, in terms of a pricing lesson for us was we needed to understand the way that training companies allocated costs and the way they allocate costs is per person per course. So what we simply did was lined up our pricing at per person per course and went, well, why, what's, what's going to give somebody a, you know, a 10 times return on our, on our product? So it basically works out you know, 5 to $7 a head per person per course depending on volume and so on. Uh, to deliver via our platform, which is, you know, a big, big saving. Yeah. So is that sort of how you're presenting the, the business case is, is mm. a savings on presentations or, or ability to sort of connect afterwards or it's, it's, the, it's the range. So, so there's a, there's a huge cost saving, you know, for example, as a client we're talking to at the moment, the cost saving for them, you know, the, the the short payback period is really for them just a bonus. The thing that they're particularly interested in is how do they get bums on seats to their next course and then how are they able to much more quickly put together a course and get that out into the market to give themselves a, a competitive advantage but also enhance the brand. You know, training companies are trying to make sure that they're looking modern and we're seeing that um, you know, people that are attending training are interested in sort of presenter tech. So they're interested in better ways of getting hold of the content and being able to interact uh, with it and in a different way to way that sort of learning management systems operate in, in traditional um, you know, educational institutions. Mm, no, fascinating. So, so is there like um, uh, sort of a repository of all the different um presentations that that you know your i guess previous presenters and now sort of training institutes institutions are, are able to view for other people the way that the way that it works is that um um you know let's say the digital de delusion is running some um some training courses you would then use 
present to, to deliver the platform. You deliver your presentation using PowerPoint or whatever it is that you like, but people would then access the presentation content face-to-face, but they'd have uh, access to that via any mobile, um, uh, any uh, internet-enabled device. They'd get access to all of your content immediately, and that's only available to those people in the room because okay. typically what happens with the, with the situation there, you're charging for it. Now, you, there is a, f- uh, a feature that enables you to make the presentation open. So, for example, what we typically find that some people have got you know, training content they charge for and sometimes there's training content they don't charge for. So, uh, in, in terms of they want to, in terms of their content strategy. So, we allow um, both both means, and we allow you to to change and chop and change um, by presentation. So it works out really effective. We find. Okay, excellent. And and do you find that um, um, that you need to do a lot of marketing as well for for these training courses? For the, for for us, yeah, our marketing's changed. Um, uh, you know, we originally were following kind of the traditional SaaS freemium model, where we would, you know, give away, um, you know, the the app for a period of time and for a number of presentations, and it just proved to be one of those classic mistakes that you know, discover with hindsight really wasn't the right way to go but was was a model that was used a lot elsewhere so it seemed to make lots of sense at the time and you know the market was conditioned to it what we've done is we've moved away from that and moved towards a um let's almost like an enterprise sale where you know, we will pique your interest if you go to um, present.com, P-R-E-Z-E-N-T-T.com. You'll find enough uh, information there to find out if that looks like it could be of interest to you. And then what we want to do is actually arrange a call with you so that we can really understand um, you know, your business, work out how it would fit, how we can best tailor it, work out pricing that's really attractive and so on, and then help on board. So we've really changed the the process in which um we we sell we think that's going to be much much more effective for us it's just a a different style of approach Uh, and typical of what you see with like a sales force or similar yeah so so more enterprise level but but do you Mm. if you could sort of pin it to one thing why do you think it the sort of other freemium model didn't work um well look it's i think i think it's an interesting Interesting one because we spent a lot of time navel gazing around it. I think what was happening is we were attracting, we were attracting the wrong end of the market. You know, we found that we were talking to some smaller firms and so on, and without having, you know, getting the chance to have uh, the interaction with them, uh, it becomes a change in process. If you look at a training company, if they're actually going to put in software like this. There are quite a few different stakeholders that need to be involved in the conversation around actually making a change and moving the whole business across to the platform. So we found that you know those people that were running smaller independent training businesses that didn't have any sort of hierarchy, they were the people that were picking the product up and running with it because they could see the value really, really quickly and easily. Where we found there was a lot more stakeholders involved, that's the kind of process that, or well, that's the kind of sale environment that that's a more complex sale, more stakeholders involved, and and really uh, where we had to, to change the sales model. Okay, no, that's good. Now, now back we were talking a little bit um, about the content and and that sort of thing. Do you? And I guess that's where my question was sort of headed. But in terms of you know, content is huge, and and sort of someone like you and me, we we want other people to read our content. So. You know, what I was kind of asking was, is there a, an ability to, you know, share the content through, um, uh, through present that actually allows other people to view it? If I allow it, of course. Yes, there is. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. So um, that was one of the things again that we were trying to trying to accommodate um, is you know those scenarios where you're doing a presentation in front of a group and people in that audience want to want to share it out and spread the conversation out further. You know, often what we find is that in a presentation, you know that sort of old maxim where people remember like one or two things about your presentation. If they've got the chance to sort of take notes against every slide, we think that there's a better chance that they'll remember 
one or two things about each and every slide in your presentation, which then means that there's a much better communication effect. And if they're sharing that further, then again, you get that acceleration. Um, so yeah, we think that's definitely an exciting opportunity there for, for our platform. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I just actually started reading this book. Um, I don't have it in front of me. It's called Impossible to Impossible to Forget, and and she gets into sort of the the neuro, neurology um, mm. of the marketing and and how we can create these messages that are very clear and people actually remember them more. So yeah, if you have mm. a tool like that where you're actually interacting and engaging, then um, then that would be a fascinating aspect and, and help us learn more because. Um, we seem to forget a lot, or at least I do. So, um, <laughs> uh, well, I think I think we're just in this fire hose of content, right? <laughs> true. I think, um, yeah. You know, and and it gets hard to to drink all of it as much as we'd like to. And if uh, you know, we could we could we could turn into professional emailers, which I think sometimes we end up a little bit like that. But we could just spend, you know, ten hours a day reading everything there is to read, uh, and still, you know, barely touch the surface uh, and not get anything done. So, it is one of those challenges of how anything you can do that helps, you know, crack through. Which I think is your point. Anything you can do to crack through uh, and make a connection and and uh, you know, stick that, uh, grab that mental piece of memory in people's minds is uh, is a really important thing to do. Yeah, and it it certainly helps because yeah, we're we're you, everybody's overwhelmed, myself included, with so much content, um, mm. and it takes up far too much time. So so on that note, like what you've obviously seen a lot of presentations through your tool, and obviously in your industry and doing what you do, what what makes a good a good presentation? What have you found that that really is helpful? Uh, I think. Um... <sighs> Again, I, th I think this area is in in involving. You know, Guy Kawasaki's done you know you know wonderful stuff in terms of helping people improve what they what they do. And you know, you look at TED talks and those sorts of things. Um, uh, I think if I come back to some of the one of the greatest pictures I've ever seen um, was a, was some guys in in Perth called with this thing called Big Help Mob. And they've turned up on stage, and you know, Bill Ty and a bunch of guys from the Valley had come out to Perth to you know look at these pictures. And you know, this guy jumps on stage, and um, you know, he's wearing a, 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 a you know a, a beanie and um, looks like he's just come from the beach, and just you know, <laughs> it, and I'm just and I'm looking at this and going, man, like this is this is a pretty high profile bunch of people. Like, what are you what are you doing? And uh, his presentation was so good um, in that he was talking about how technology makes you know, younger people feel really disaffected. And on the other side of the coin, you've got so many charities that are trying to do really good stuff, but they just don't have the, the manpower. And the words he used was, we want to punch these problems in the face. And, <laughs> okay. and it was just this wonderful, wonderful analogy. And, and I remember... I remember at the end of this pitch, I was just about in tears and wanted to run up and give them money um, oh, really? to, to donate to the cause. I was, I mean, they, they won and, and everything else, but it was just one of the best pitches I think I've, I've ever seen. So unpacking it, what is it, you know, making sure that people get really, really quickly that there's a, you know, a clear and compelling, in terms of a pitch, right, in terms of a, a clear and compelling problem to solve that makes it real it gets sort of an emotional connection and then the logical solution and so on you you get that stuff right the story behind it all um you're you're going to do well no excellent cool thanks thanks for your insight on that um and so i'm um, you just sort of as you said pivoted uh with present but but where where do you see the future of this type of tool and type of uh method of communication yeah, look, I think um, there's an interesting gap. We, we're calling it a, a, a training delivery platform. Um, we think that there's there's massive market, as you know, in you know webinar style delivery where you want to reach lots of people that you're not in front of. There's also lots of things going on in you know tertiary institutions and so on where 
you've got courses and there's there's learning management systems that are managing the you know the students and the people that are attending their assignments and coursework and all the rest of it. The gap, which is kind of a bit missing, is the place where we're playing is where you're actually in front of people and you're actually delivering training. There's some a few different tools out there allow you to you know put the your screen in terms of what you're showing on the user's screen, but that by itself is not that engaging really. So we think that there's this great little um, great little niche there that sort of fits in amongst everything else, which uh, as as yet hasn't been really very well served. I think there'll be I think there'll be a lot more change. I think that the you know what we're seeing is a lot of these companies are you know sensing that moving away from paper and towards digital is inevitable so then it's a case of which platform that they uh, you know jump onto and which they try and i heartily suggest that they start exploring uh, soon we're quite happy to help out um, mm. your listeners with a, an offer an offer around that um, so that they can try our platform and and have a feel uh, for that and see if that's a, a fit and, and if that starts them down the journey to moving towards something better then we're absolutely delighted to help yeah. Do you, do you think the pace is a bit slow then for sort of implementation? The implementation's yeah, pretty pretty easy from our perspective, mm. but in terms of how the speed of the, the way the market's moving. Yeah, I'm yeah um, more towards the market side. I know yeah, you're fast. Think, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to I was going to say the same thing about yourself. Yeah, you know, we we're able to we think sort of we think natively digital, right? Yes. So. Um, you know, thinking about speed to implement and all of that kind of stuff is, um, you know, pretty nimble in terms of that regard. There isn't a lot of cultural shift or any of those kinds of things to consider. Uh, but I think that is one of the challenges that digital and digital disruption is putting onto businesses is, you know, the pace and capacity to, to innovate and change and move culture and all of that kind of stuff is just, is just not an easy thing. Um, a lot of people actually don't like change, believe it or not. It just seems to be one of those things where people just like to have a you know, nice, common approach and know what they're doing. That's because it's you know, easy. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, where's, where's the fun and easy, right? So yeah. uh, yeah. we want, we'll, um, want to be changing it up. I just thought I might tell you a little story about how I kind of, in, the, in a funny way, ended up doing what I'm doing. Um, you know, my background is a is a marketing one. I uh, did a, a degree in marketing, and uh, then went into business, and you know, did advertising, and you know, ended up of all things running a software development company and getting involved in startups and a range of different things. But I guess one of the, the one of the really foundation things, foundation experiences for me was my parents owned shops when I was a kid, when I was about sixteen. Or really, from the, about the age of of uh, about nine they owned them. Problem was that they were dress shops. And if you are a guy, a teenage guy, about the single worst thing in the world your parents can own is a dress shop. You know, a motorbike <laughs> shop, yeah. music shop, like any, you know, nearly, nearly, you know, anything would have been better than dress shops. But, you know, you deal with, with what you got. But so doesn't I it depend to... on, you know, what color the dress is or? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I've never, I've never found that trying them on and standing in front of oh, the mirror okay. makes me look any better in them. But right. anyway, yeah. you go. So, um, anyway, so I was working in them and I found my father always said to me, you know, study people. They're interesting. So one of the things I found really odd was that we'd have people that would come to the the line of the door and they would sort of lean in from the left round to the right if you can kind of imagine that and have a bit of a peer in and then they'd turn around and walk out and I'd think what is what's that about then you'd see someone come to this little sort of heart shape that was about sort of a meter and a half into the store and they'd sort of you know walk in and take a couple of steps and then they'd pick up pick up sort of terminal velocity and walk out. And I was thinking, that's that's really odd. And the, the shop's layout was basically, you know, long down the left side and then long down the right side and some racks in the middle. So some people would come in and they'd start walking down the left side, have a look, and then they'd start walking down the right side and then go to walk out. And I was playing basketball then, so I started guarding 
some of them and you know blocking them from walking out and that freaked a few of them out that wasn't working so so what i so what i found was that i, I worked out that my job was to get them into the change room and let with, me explain with, some, what I mean with by, some clothes right yeah right let me explain what i mean by that so i found that if i could get them into the change room and try something on and find something that they look fantastic in and then let them know i'd succeeded by saying something like hey, you look fantastic in that, the chances of them buying went up to one and two, maybe two out of three. Up until that point, pretty much no chance that they were going to buy. And if you think about that in terms of sales, conversion, and all of that kind of stuff, it's a nice analogy for stepping stones. You look at digital and what's going on right now. There's so much happening in terms of conversion optimization and traffic generation and social media interaction and so on but if you can't work out how you get them in terms of the steps all the way into the change room and trying something on you're never going to sell mm -hmm. and so that's really a lot of the stuff that i found people really understand when you use that story they really understand what it is that you're trying to do for them yeah and no, that's profound really when you think about it from the digital so so what's the the digital metaphor then how, how do you actually do that well i think it's a number it's a number of different things you know for me i really like starting with you know customer personas and understanding you know the problems that people have and the things that they're trying to solve and and really getting to the essence of why um a company's offering is special and if it's doesn't seem to be that special if it's become run of the mill then you've got to look at how you make it special again then i like thinking about the stepping stones you know what are the different paths you know some people use the good old-fashioned you know ada model the attention interest desire action but generally what i find is that there's often some different steps you know they've got to find out a little bit of information they might need to try you know watch a video do a trial all those kinds of things you know, one of the things that I think is really quite interesting now is that you've got multi-platform thrown in there as well. So in terms of tracking the, the way that people work, it starts to become an interesting data data question. Um, you know, for example, a uh, project I'm working on at the moment, we're looking at, um, you know, a particular online, you know, quoting form that we want people to work on. Now, we expect that some of them are going to start their interaction on a mobile phone in a coffee shop or when they're out and about. They're then going to start the process and then want to perhaps uh, either talk to somebody immediately, get somebody to call them back when convenient, or continue the process when they get back to the desktop. So you've got to allow for those paths and you've got to track those paths. And I think that the trick now, we've got so much available to us in analytics and conversion optimization tools and all the rest of it. We've still got to not lose sight of what is it, what's the customer journey to sort of get into the change room and try something on and really consider buying. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Some some excellent steps. So how, how does that, um, is that something that you'd, so you would help people walk through that stage then as well or? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that's you know exactly what we what we try and do with uh, with imagination. You know, often what I do as a starting point with businesses, and, and bearing in mind we do this you know the strategy marketing digital, but we also do some business coaching as well more generally. So what we typically do is start them off in terms of understanding the business with a with a diagnostic. Uh, if you go to the imagination website and just click on diagnostics, there's a there's a growth and profit. Um, diagnostic there and so running through that gives us a real quick feel on you know what are the sort of the key uh, issues that are going on in the business um, not only from a marketing front that are preventing the business from growing um, so with those we then just start putting the strategies and, and actions in place to start looking at uh, how we grow and typically you know, understanding that customer journey um, is is so important to um to get that right one of my favorite quotes is by peter drucker and peter drucker said you know the reason a business exists is to create and serve and serve a customer and i think it's just a nice line you know when we get lost in all the strategy talk and all the you know, stuff that goes on fundamentally we exist to 
you know, create and, and uh, successfully serve and satisfy a customer. Yeah, because otherwise you wouldn't technically have a business. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Profound, but so one funny. of those. Yeah, it's it's like so obvious, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you have to say it. It's like, yeah, wait a sec. All this yeah. other stuff, all this other fluff we're doing, it doesn't make sense. It's not sort of helping that end customer as well. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So so you were actually um, uh, talking about the. The uh, diagnostic. So when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that you know you know you'd be happy to to help out a few of our um, uh, listeners on that. Can you explain what you would do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if simply any, anybody that would like to give it a try, just simply go to the Emergination website, emergination.com.au forward slash diagnostic, or you can just grab it from the menu at the top. And, and there's two diagnostics there. One is a growth and, growth and profit diagnostic, which goes through the business in terms of you know, all of those kinds of issues, you know, things like clarity of business vision, direction, and so on. And there's a second one, which is a change success diagnostic. What I typically do with, um, with customers uh, and clients is run through that diagnostic and then spend you know, an hour or two actually running through what the answers mean, understand why um, people picked the answers that they did, and then start to put together a sort of a, a quick and a high level uh, one page plan on what they should then be focusing on from there. Um, I'd be absolutely happy to um, provide that at no cost to um, uh, to the listeners of Digital Dis- Delusion. Perfect. No, that's fantastic, Justin. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, so in, in just sort of wrapping things up, you know, overall, how, how do you see things developing with, with digital and, um, you know, business online and that sort of thing? Where, where are we headed? Oh, great, great, great question. Um, oh, how to answer. Look, I think data is going to become more important. Um, and, and, you know, the whole, there's all that sort of big data question, but it's really getting, the, you know, marketers and, you know, chief digital officers and so on need to get much better at understanding user experience and data across all levels. You know, what's happening in store, what's happening in terms of mobile uh, interaction, what's happening with after sales, you know, what's having impacts on all of that. Um, then being able to be in a better position in terms of um, you know, helping customers more effectively and more effectively growing the businesses and working out um, what makes sense. I'm seeing that um, we're also starting to see a change in SaaS software pricing. And I'm noticing that there's there's a move towards making more profit by some of these companies, and and perhaps it's it's not only making more profit; it's it's trying to get to profitability more quickly. Uh, there's been you know, quite a sharp leap in some of the costs of different tools that are that are out there that are trying to seek sort of number one positions and so on. So there's a lot of stuff happening in conversion optimization software and and backer house stuff um, that's really interesting. You know, in terms of our own startup. It, it feels to me, um, you know, you've spent some time in Western Australia, you know Kalgoorlie. So Kalgoorlie is um, a gold mining town, sort of fairly remote in Western Australia, and it's got a thing called the Super Pit, which is this enormous, enormous um, open-cut mine. The If you look, if you see any of the Google Earth photos there, you'll see all these little holes that poke out, you know, up to 150 metres deep. And they were all the original tunnels that the gold miners dug by hand all those years ago. The people that made lots of money on the gold mines were often the guys that were selling stuff to the gold miners, the guys that were selling shovels and wheelbarrows and overalls <laughs> and all, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So the point of the story is that there's lots of companies out there selling you know, shovels and overalls and wheelbarrows to you know, SaaS providers and <laughs> it seems to be you know, some interesting uh, money uh, to be made around it, you know, helping companies improve those uh, improve those so it's becoming less cheap to start up um you know that said uh, a lot of these tools are really good in terms of 
accelerating your risk of uh, so accelerating your chances of success and speed to success. So, uh, which is the only reason why you buy anything anyway. <laughs> Usually, or at least to try it out. <laughs> Absolutely, have a play. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. Okay. No, well, well, thank you, Justin. It's It's been a, a fantastic, um, enlightening experience. And I really enjoyed your insights into, you know, that new tool that you've been developing, your pivot, um, marketing, digital automation, that sort of thing. So, so thank you so much for sharing um, your ideas and that sort of thing. So for yeah, our, thanks Doyle wonderful yeah. thank you for the opportunity to chat with you it's great to uh, great to catch up with you again yeah no for sure and and for all of our listeners um how, how do how can they find you online you you mentioned emergination.com.au um you're yes. also on twitter on linkedin yes yeah so linkedin uh is just uh, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash justin k davies uh, twitter is uh, at Justin K Davies, so you can see a theme coming through there, uh, and uh, Emergination E M E R G I N A T I O N dot com dot au, uh, and of course, if anybody's interested in present, again, we'd love to um, help. We'd be quite happy to uh, offer uh, two uh, full months free on uh, that platform to anybody that's interested in that. So just simply go to present p r e z e n w t dot com. And uh, just mention the podcast, and uh, we'd be happy to help them out. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and and we'll also have all those links and all those ways of getting in touch with uh, you, Justin, on our website, uh, thedigitaldelusion dot com slash podcast. So all of those details and all those links will be there. So, all right. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Justin. I really appreciate your time, and um, we will see you guys online. Thank you very much for listening to Breaking Digital, the podcast for smart entrepreneurs wanting to become true digital leaders in their industry and to own online. If you have any comments on the program, please feel free to connect on Twitter at Doyle Bueller with the hashtag own online. I would really appreciate it if you could share this podcast with your network, as I'm sure they will get some value from it for building their successful business online as well. You can find the resources that we talked about, as well as the transcript and full podcast for download on thedigitaldelusion.com slash podcast or on iTunes or on SoundCloud. I'm Doyle Bueller, and I will see you online. Thank you for listening to Breaking Digital with Doyle Bueller. While he goes and makes a sandwich, you can find all of the notes, links, and details on this podcast by visiting thedigitaldelusion.com slash podcast. Go on and click that now, www.thedigitaldelusion.com slash podcast. I'll definitely click that. If you'd like a free copy of the book, The Digital Delusion, How to Overcome the Misguidance and Misinformation Online, just send an email to doyle at thedigitaldelusion.com. See you online.